This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 292 of Literary Treks. We are your dedicated Star Trek books and comics show here on the Trek FM network. Well, I'm sure you're no stranger to my co-host. I'm Dan Gunther, but joining me, as always, of course, is Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how are you today? I'm good. And you mentioned that this show is dedicated to Star Trek books and comics. Is that a hint about today's feature? The word dead acated? Ooh, uh, yes, that is indeed what I meant. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, no, today we are discussing a new release, which is always a fun thing for this show. Uh, The new release, of course, being the Star Trek Discovery novel Dead Endless by Dave Gallanter. And joining us in the feature will be the author himself, Dave Gallanter. He has joined us for this episode. So really excited for that discussion. But before we get there, we do have a new comic as well to review this week. And that comic is a Star Trek Voyager comic. Now, this is kind of rare. We don't get a lot of these. This is Star Trek Voyager Mirrors and Smoke. So this is the uh, Mirror Universe USS Voyager or ISS Voyager, I guess. And this uh, issue is written by Paul Allor with art by J.K. Woodward, uh, which I'm really excited about. I always love J.K. Woodward's style. And this is a one shot comic. This is just a single issue, not an ongoing series maybe it'll turn into an ongoing type thing like the TNG Mirror Universe stuff did. But for now, this is just a one-shot comic. So, Which it even says at the top left-hand corner, one-shot. Yes, it does. That's right. So they're, they're really, they're make they're letting you know, like, don't look for issue two next week or next month. This is, this is it. This is it, folks. So... Uh, Yeah, so let's, uh, we're going to get into the comic here right away. But first, I just kind of want uh, your general impressions of this issue, Bruce. What did you think of this one? Well, my first thought was, okay, this is really cool. Because like you mentioned earlier, we don't get a lot of Voyager comics. So, you know, we've been on a Voyager drought here for a while. And it's like, oh, it's so great. We're getting Voyager and we're getting the Mirror Universe, which we haven't seen much of. We haven't seen Voyager in the Mirror Universe in the comics, but I know there have been some books that take place in the Mirror Universe with Voyager, which I haven't read those yet. I've read some of the Mirror Universe stuff, but not all. So I Mm -hmm. don't know. I mean, I I assume this doesn't tie into those, Uh, but that's the one thing I wish is I had read those so I can compare the two. But unfortunately, I'm coming in in this going, I don't know. I haven't read those. Yeah, I I haven't read the dedicated Voyager. I think Dark Passions is one that has Seven of Nine or or Annika Hansen from the Mirror Universe on the cover. Yeah, Um, There are a few Voyager characters in the David Mack novel Rise Like Lions, if I remember correctly, but it's been a long time since I read those. 
Uh, so yeah, I, I don't really remember a lot about them. We have seen one mirror Voyager crew member though in, uh, Canon Star Trek. Do you know who that might be, Bruce? Do you remember? Was it Tuvok? It was Tuvok in the Deep Space Nine episode through the looking glass. He was part of the Terran rebellion that we saw there. Yeah, so. I hadn't thought about it until you were asking the question. I'm like, oh, wait, I remember this now. <laughs> Yeah. So that was uh, during Deep Space Nine's third season, which would have been Voyager's first season. Now, I I noticed on Twitter, I think it was uh, IDW or the author or something way back when was saying the Tuvok in this story is that same Tuvok. So Voyager got thrown to the other side of the galaxy uh, sometime after that episode, apparently, because this is the same Tuvok. Well, now that would make sense based on the uniforms that they wear in this comic, because they're more of the, let's call them the first contact uniforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely more of a, and I think they give the year that Voyager was thrown as 2372, which would definitely be later than our Voyager in quotation marks. Uh, got thrown into the Delta Quadrant. Right. But this comic takes place four years after that. Mm hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's get right into this. So, first of all, um, like I said, I love the artwork. I always love J.K. Woodward's painted style. And he's talked to us before about how long it takes him to do this artwork. And it really does show. Yeah, I really love going back to this artwork and, and looking at it again. And we, it's been pretty consistent in the Mirror Universe because all the Mirror Universe comics lately have been in this style. Um, That's true, yeah. You know, so I think from now on, when they do a Mirror Universe comic, we're going to see J.K. Woodward doing him. <laughs> that would be cool. I would, I would be totally behind that for sure. Um, so yeah, in this, we learn that Janeway is, uh, kind of as according to Neelix anyway, the self-proclaimed pirate queen of the Delta Quadrant. So when our Voyager got thrown into the Delta Quadrant, they resolved to get home, right? They were going to try and fly home, but this Voyager Janeway has decided that, nope, she's going to make a name for herself to heck with the Terran rebellion and everything back in the alpha quadrant. She's going to be this pirate queen plundering people all over the Delta quadrant. And for the most part, her crew's behind her, but Tuvok apparently keeps <laughs> raising a bit of objections saying, well, I think it would be logical to go back to the alpha quadrant and rejoin the rebellion. And she's like, ah, you always say that. I'm, I'm sick of you saying that, but yeah. And, and it makes me wonder also, as you said, it seems like the rest of the crew is along with it with hers to stay there. But then I don't know, maybe they're just not speaking up. It, I, I would be curious to know how many are against staying versus how many are willing to stay because there could be a revolt and some kind of mutiny on the ship at some That's point. true. If there's one thing the, the mirror universe is known for, it's for people backstabbing their superiors to kind of get their own way for sure. Well, the, the story starts out with the Voyager confronting what they're calling the dread ship back seal, which is Neelix's ship. Of course, that's his freighter. And in this one, Neelix isn't a part of the crew, but has been following Voyager along with Kess in the back seal, trying to, um, you know, one up Janeway and, you know, I don't know exactly what he's trying to do, but he does seem to be obsessed with Voyager somehow, but they've got a Starfleet shuttlecraft and a tractor beam and Janeway decides to rescue uh, whoever's on this shuttlecraft because they're reading one human life sign aboard. Did you have a guess as to who that was before we found out? Uh, no, I didn't even try to guess because I was too interested in the fact that we have Commander Cavett on there, her original first officer. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting touch. So he didn't, <laughs> I always, okay, there's that scene in the pilot episode of Voyager where they say, all hands brace for impact and everybody grabs their consoles and everybody hunches down. But for some reason, Commander Cavett decides to sprint across the bridge. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, and of course he, he dies. <laughs> so apparently in this universe, he didn't do that. And he actually braced for impact like he was told to. Yeah. Sorry. I just always find that hilarious. But um, 
I, I don't know. I had this, I was like, my brain was going, I was like, okay, it's a, it's a Starfleet shuttlecraft or, you know, Terran rebellion shuttle. I don't know, whatever. Um, so I was like, is it the, is it someone from the crew of the Equinox? Like who are the other humans we've seen in the Delta Quadrant in our universe? But of course they beam this person aboard and it turns out to be Annika Hansen, seven of nine in our universe. But in this universe, she was never assimilated by the Borg. Uh, she escaped the Borg uh, when her parents were assimilated and she's kind of been on the run ever since. And she tells Janeway's crew this and the aforementioned commander Cavett says, wait, what's a Borg? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. What is a Borg? And you're like, and then Annika Hansen's expression is like, oh, what? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> oh, by the way, mm-hmm. going back to your question about who's on the show, I do remember thinking it was Chakotay. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because we get little glimpses of him and it took me a while to figure out where he was here because we don't really see him at all yeah. uh, until there's like one shot of him from behind talking to Janeway and I was like, who's that guy? And, you know, later on we're like, oh, okay, that's Chicote. But it's weird that he's not focused on at the beginning of this at all. But yeah, so, you know, they don't know the Borg, and so that plays an interesting part of this story. But what I really like is the Doctor in this scene, because Annika is talking to the Doctor as if he's just, you know, a regular crew member, and he appreciates that. And Janeway's like, come on, he's just a hologram. That's it. He's not a real person. Get over it. Yeah, definitely, uh, which makes sense for how a crew from this universe would see the doctor and and that sort of thing. Now, what's interesting is after they've beamed Annika on board over the next little while, there's all these weird malfunctions that keep creeping up. Uh, The replicators are apparently trying to poison people and gravity and gravity just flips around at a moment's notice and people are getting injured. And since this all started happening after Annika came aboard, they figure, oh, well, it must be her fault. They're kind of trying to figure that out. And then uh, <laughs> we get an interesting scene in a cargo bay with uh, the fate of this universe's Commander Cavett that I thought was really interesting. Uh, Chakotay makes his move here because... Darn it, he's he wants to be the first officer and, and Commander Cavett is in his way. So there's a explosive decompression and they're both holding on to the console and it's starting to give way. Chakotay says, this thing can't support both of us and neither can Voyager's command structure. And Cavett <laughs> says, Chakotay, no, <laughs> we need to work together. We need to. And Chakotay just kicks him out the door. <laughs> he's gone. He's gone. <laughs> and no one seems to really care. Because even Janeway <laughs> sees on the viewer and she's just like, doesn't even really say anything. Yeah, she's like, oh, um, Tom, Chakotay, what's your status? Sensor show you is the only survivors. And <laughs> she's looking at the bodies of these crew members, you know, rotating by. But uh, in the meantime, we've learned that uh, it's not Annika Hansen who's causing these malfunctions. Or it kind of is, but she's not doing this for herself she's working with someone and it turns out that the doctor is behind it all it's the doctor and she's his companion oh wait that's another series sorry (laughs) (laughs) no okay (laughs) but yeah no so uh the doctor has realized by the way that annika treated him that like he's mistreated by the voyager crew and he's had enough and He's evolved, right? So he's allowed uh, access all over the ship. He's learned to communicate with the computer. And in that time, he's kind of evolved and learned to do certain things and assert his rights as a individual, I guess. So let me ask you this. If this were the prime universe and the crew was treating the doctor in the same manner this crew is, where... They just treat him like he's just a tool, that he's not a human and he doesn't have feelings and he's just a plain old hologram. Do you think the EMH would revolt against the crew in some manner? Possibly in some manner, but probably not to this extent, because I think he's he's learned 
proper behavior from the crew and that sort of thing. And this is, he's, he's acting like a human being would in this universe, I think. So, um, in our universe, yeah. yeah, like in our universe, what he does is he brings his concerns to the captain and the captain listens and weighs options. And sometimes he has to prove himself, but that's also kind of what a human in our universe would do if, if he or she saw something that wasn't right or felt they were being mistreated, you know? So I think in both universes, he just kind of learns the proper way of doing things from the people around him. <laughs> yeah. And whoever programs him in this universe is more on the mirror side. So he's programmed maybe even a little differently, but it did make me think that, you know, if he wasn't treated nicely and treated as being something that could be real, then you know, he, I don't know how he would have reacted with the regular prime Voyager crew, not saying that he would sabotage the ship in any way, but I just mm-hmm. wonder what he would have done. Would he have just, you know, shut himself off and just be gone or I don't know. In some ways, I wonder if he would have revolted in some manner. Yeah. The, the one thing I'm drawn to is the season seven episode where he goes along with Iden's holographic revolution and kind of betrays Voyager a right. little bit there. Yes. So, yeah, if he's pushed enough, if he's evolved enough, he can definitely uh, wreak some havoc, I think. <laughs> yeah. He could be the next Andy Dick. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, in this universe, though, he and Seven <laughs> decide that uh, they can probably run the ship with just a skeleton crew. So they uh, they don't kill everybody, but they knock everybody out for the most part. Um, but this allows uh, Neelix and what uh, somebody called his psychopath, <laughs> Kess, <laughs> um, to take advantage of the situation. And it turns out she really is. And she reminded me of uh, the episode of Voyager that I really dislike. Yes. But Fury, when Kess comes back and is blowing up the walls and stuff. And yes. And that's kind of what Kess here is doing. You mentioned that episode uh, a few episodes ago, and I had to go and watch it again just because oh. you, you just hate it so much. I was like, I it's just feel so like bad. watching it. <laughs> It's so bad. I'm sorry. I'm usually very positive when it comes to Star Trek, but that is not a good episode. I don't I, like what it did to her character. No, I know. But I, okay. <laughs> so in this issue though, I was a little confused because it looks like they ram their ship into Voyager, which then I realized, I guess this is a shuttle pod from their ship. I think so. Yeah, that's kind of it looks like they slam into it with a shuttle pod, but beam in at the same time. Or yeah, something. that's what I think so. But at first when I read it, I was thinking it was their ship, but then we see their ship later and it would be bigger than this. Mm-hmm. But it was never identified that they were on a shuttle pod. Yeah, it's kind of weird. The story does that a couple times where it kind of jumps into a situation and I'm like, wait, okay, how did they get there? What's going on? Right. Um, and that was definitely one of the most confusing for me there. Same here. Yeah. So Kess and Neelix get on the ship and start wreaking havoc, but they uh, end up kind of decompiling the doctor, not decompiling him, but like erasing his memory and, and uh, bending him to their will kind of thing, uh, which allows him to be initiated into protocol seven later on to take back the ship from Kess and Neelix. I'm going to be honest, this whole end bit kind of gets a little bit confusing and convoluted with all the double crosses and, and who's in control of what here. Did you have a tough time with this or was that just me? Um, I didn't really have a tough time with it. But I did have a bit of an issue with uh, when they're in front of Captain Janeway or Commodore Janeway, whatever she is now. uh, And she mentions that because they deprogrammed the doctor, now his memory had been erased and now he could refer back, refer back to his subroutine programming that would help her achieve getting back control of the ship or whatever. And I thought, well, how does she know that they deactivated him and wiped his memory? Yeah. Like, that's kind of what I mean. Like, there's a lot of 
just assumptions and jumping around. Yeah, she's me. like, and, you and, restored him to his true purpose. And I'm like, but how does she know that? Mm-hmm. Unless she had access to the computer system and saw that. But, I mean, they were captured at this point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a little odd to me. But uh, suffice it to say, they do end up taking the ship back from Kess and Neelix and, I guess, the Doctor. And Annika gets thrown in the brig as well. And for some reason, she's wearing a skin-tight bodysuit like Seven of Nine wears. Um, I guess just because, in this case. It's like, why not? <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> I don't know where that would have come from because she wasn't wearing that when she was in the EV suit and got captured. I didn't think so. She yeah. had something like a crop top on or something. Cause I remember her <laughs> wearing that in sick bay when she was putting the suit on. Yeah. So maybe this was just in the brig on. somewhere. Like it's, you know, it's prisoner clothing for people who could be Borg. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess so. So yeah, she's in the brig now, uh, letting her kind of, uh, conspire with Neelix. They're going to plan their next move. But in the meantime, Janeway, as you said, is now a Commodore because she leads a fleet of two ships now, not just Voyager, but Voyager and the dread ship Baxiel. Uh, and their mission, much to Tuvok's chagrin, who still thinks they should return to the Alpha Quadrant, uh, their mission, though, is to acquire new technology and become even more fearsome. So what she's going to do in her final order is... Let's go find the Borg. Yeah. And I really like how that ended. That was really Mm -hmm. cool. And then it ends saying the end question mark. Yeah, exactly. Like the TNG mirror universe once did. So Hmm. yeah, which maybe we see some kind of crossover eventually. Maybe they're going to do that. The one thing I noticed, and I'm just going to talk about the final frame of this comic a little bit is we get a shot of Voyager and the back seal flying off together now, what's interesting is the back seal of this universe looks exactly like the back seal of our universe, but it's a heck of a lot bigger because it's behind Voyager flying in tandem with them. And in our universe, Voyager kept it in their shuttle bay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big ship. <laughs> well, uh, that or Voyager smaller in this universe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... That could be, I guess. (laughs) No, you're right. I mean, I guess we just assume that, yeah, it's a bigger ship in this universe. It's it's the same style, but because Neelix is doing something different, he's more of a commander of a bigger ship. I don't know. Sure. Works for me. (laughs) Okay. So one thing I do want to point out real quick is uh, Tom Paris. Did you notice he Mm -hmm. stutters? He does. He reminded me of Barkley a lot yeah, in this. Yeah, that's what I thought, Which too. is funny, because Barkley in the Mirror Universe was not like Barkley at all. So, yeah, interesting. And I was thinking, since Tom seems to get himself in trouble, they're making him maybe the innocent, kind of limpy guy in here, and he kind of stutters and not really sure what to do or something. He's asking mm-hmm. questions. So maybe he's the Barkley, and Barkley's the tom paris in this universe. i guess so yeah i'm i'm glad they didn't make harry kim that character because like oh man harry kim is just always the butt of jokes uh so i'm glad that he just seems like a perfectly competent ruthless terran in this <laughs> yeah yeah it would be cool if he was like he killed captain janeway and became captain of the voyager mm-hmm. and he's like that's how you get promoted around here <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, uh, what are your kind of final thoughts and a uh, rating for this one shot Voyager mirror comic? Um, I, th- I thought it was really good outside of those few little things we say, you know, a little confusing or don't really quite add up. I mean, again, the art is fantastic. I enjoyed the story. It was great seeing the Voyager crew again and doing it in the mirror universe. And I like the idea that Janeway, uh, escaped the Alpha Quadrant, that she was a Cardassian prisoner and she got flown into the Delta Quadrant with her band of rebels and they want to kind of conquer the Delta Quadrant. And so this has been fun. So yeah, I, I you know, give it like four out of five big ships that should be small. <laughs> yeah, um, I enjoyed it for the most part as well. The art is what really stands out to me for sure, with as usual with J.K. Woodward. 
the story seemed a little bit, I don't know, kind of meandering and, and jumpy around in a couple places. And I didn't, you know, I, I, I'm not the hugest fan of the mirror universe. I feel like maybe sometimes we go back to it a little too often, but it wasn't bad. Uh, and you know, it's enjoyable and it's good to see these guys in a comic because it's usually, uh, you know, the, the original series that we're seeing or not necessarily Voyager usually. So that was nice. So I'd have to agree maybe around a four out of five for me as well. Yeah, so, you know, for a one-shot, definitely pick it up, read it. Well, before we get to the feature, we do, as usual, want to visit some of your uh, listener comments from the Babel Conference. Now, we're recording this actually only a few days after this particular episode we're going to be talking about came out, so we don't have many comments, but the comments we do have were very good, so uh, always happy to hear from you guys. So this is for Literary Trek's 290 give me all the spock in which we talked about discovery's comic uh, trilogy aftermath with brandy jackala so david Plummer says another good episode i'll add this series to my list to check out loving this trek renaissance in all sorts of media who could have imagined just a few years back that i'd be looking forward to seeing christopher pike eat a walk of gach <laughs> definitely uh not me so yeah good call <laughs> I'm loving how many uh, comics and neat stories we're getting in this whole, uh, you know, some people are calling it golden age, new golden age of Star Trek. So Ooh, I, like I think that. I agree with that. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, we had spaghetti the other night. My wife put down a big pot of spaghetti. I thought, oh, it's like, you know, Pike eating all that as gawk. Mm. <laughs> uh, Justin Ozer says, great episode. I really enjoyed the first two issues, but felt the third one wrapped up a bit too quickly. About the two houses protocol that Laurel triggers, I thought that it was a reference to Laurel being from two different houses, Mokai, her mother's house, and Takuvma, her father's house. I think, Justin, that you get the gold star for the day, because I think you're exactly right. Yeah, I think out of everything that we've thought of, that absolutely makes the most sense. Good call on that one. All right. Well, with that, what do you say we pop over to the feature and welcome our special guest, Dave Gallanter, to the show? I'm looking forward to it because this is the first time I've ever talked to him. Excellent. So as we mentioned at the top of the show, we are going to be talking about the newest Star Trek Discovery novel, Dead Endless by Dave Gallanter. And, uh, you know, we can't, as usual, just j discuss these among the two of us. We need to bring in a special guest. So joining us is the author himself, Dave Gallanter. Dave, welcome back to the show. It's good to be here and it's good to talk with both of you. Awesome. Always happy to have you on and uh, always happy when your name pops up on the upcoming books because, uh, you know, I, I've kind of ranted and raved about how much I love your, especially the TOS novels of yours I've read, Troublesome Minds and Crisis of Consciousness. Oh, thank I you. I really loved. Yes, me too. So, you, really exciting that you're doing a Discovery novel this time around. It was uh, it, it was a little bit of a surprise for me, um, but uh, and a little bit more difficult because I've lived with uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy and the crew for many, many years, since as long as I can remember, and I have their voices down. And so for Discovery, to make sure that I could relate the same sort of voices into the page that I do with uh, the other characters, um, I watched the, I guess it's probably 14 or, no, it would be 28 to 30 hours available uh, of, uh, of Star Trek Discovery, almost on a loop. I probably <laughs> have seen each show five or six times. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, so this novel's a little different from most of the other novels we've covered. So we're going to get into spoilers pretty quickly. But before we do that, um, I wonder if you might talk just a little bit about uh, the process of writing this without getting into spoilery bits and kind of uh, how the novel came about and how you ended up. Uh, writing this particular entry? Um, I guess that uh, they reached out to me. Um, uh, their acquiring editor reached out to me and asked if I would be interested. And um, I had actually, I think, probably gotten a heads up that that might be happening 
uh, because I'm friends with Kirsten Beyer, who's the story editor and one of the writers on Star Trek Discovery, and actually one of the uh, producers, I think producer, and certainly co-creator of Star Trek Picard. Um, so, and she used to write novels and, uh, she's been a good friend and, uh, she does amazing work. And, uh, the task was to get with her because these novels are a little bit more, uh, sort of linked in with continuity as best they can be, or at least, you know, you work with her and uh, she lets you know, this is where we'd want to go with that character in a novel form. And um, I was sent the script. I got on the script list. I'm not for this year, so I have no idea what's happening season three. <laughs> but I did read the script for season two before it aired, which was a bit of a thrill. Um, and by the way, the scripts as written are good, but way better when acted. The actors and directors really... In fact, there were a couple of moments that I didn't feel good about on the page and I thought, hmm, I, d I don't know why they would make this choice or, or Pike seems a little glib. And then the actors made it work so well. I was really impressed with season two. Um, but season two moved so fast that when I read the scripts, I went, I called Kirsten and I said, I don't know where to fit a, fit a story in here because <laughs> there's no downtime. And mm -hmm. I would have loved right. to have used um, Pike. And I would have loved to have used Spock, if even possible. Um, and it actually would have been fun to have used Emperor Giorgio. Uh, but there was no place I could do that. So the book that we had to craft had to be a little bit different just to accommodate. Um, and I didn't want to do one of the... Because uh, they had done sort of backstory that took place years ago a few times. And I didn't... I wanted to do something with the voices of the actors and the characters on the page as they were today. And uh, Kirsten had an idea um, and I ran with it and got her a sort of a, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's a proposal. It was uh, more fleshed out and, um, and she liked it and we talked about it. It was this awesome collaboration. I couldn't tell you anymore whose idea was what, because we would just talk on the phone and, and hash it out. And, uh, I love that sort of collaboration because it was free and easy. Um, and it just a really good time. And, uh, then I had a certain amount of time to write the book and, um, I got it in on time at least. <laughs> 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 that's good so i'm curious though because you said that kirsten kind of had this idea she did was it was this an idea that possibly came up in the writer's room that they abandoned or decided not to do or is this totally original no it came from it came from me saying uh, where do i fit a story into this into season two um and um uh and actually i had said to her uh you know uh Arium uh, well, that's not a spoiler if you've seen season two. Arium dies in season two. And I felt she really should have had more backstory. And I'm like, maybe I can do something with Arium. And, and she said, you know what? I think you would be better doing something with, uh, with Culber and Stamets. And I was like, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, and it gave me an idea and it gave her an idea. So I, if, if if the suggestion there was one very clear well two very clear suggestions she made at the start um that may have come from something previously i don't think so though it was a very organic sort of discussion that we were having as i paced around my den because when i'm on the phone with someone usually working on something i tend to pace um and uh as my heart rate got higher i got very excited and like scribbling notes down as I'm walking. Um, and it was just, uh, like I say it, it, it just sort of flowed. So I, I don't think it had been anything previously because it, it seriously, it came out of the discussion of what are we going to do about this? Mm -hmm. um, Cause I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I, I mean, here's the problem. They did have a little downtime that you could fit a story in probably two or three days but how do you connect whatever emotional stuff that you want to do in the book 
that might be somewhat independent of what's happening in the story and make sure that the emotions right before that book and right after that book dovetail with each other still. Right. And yet it, you're not going to see the result on screen. It just didn't make a lot of sense to me as to how to do it. And I know, I'm not sure they can do a book that way. They could certainly have something between seasons, um, but doing something in the middle of the season because it's the whole season is a, ch- is a book itself mm-hmm. with sort of episode chapters. Yeah. Um, it's like saying, here, write a book between chapter three and chapter four. Right. It's, it's a hard task. Probably a better writer could handle it. I could not. <laughs> Which we'll get to here in a moment when we get to the spoiler section, but I do want to comment about this, where the book falls in, because it's there a was secret. a time. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's where we'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, you know, there's not much we can do to advance the discussion of this book, I think, without really kind of getting into the spoilers. So I think we're going to have to drop that warning here. Uh, if you haven't read this book, I really urge you to grab it and pick it up and and read it before you continue on with this podcast. Uh, because, yeah, we're going to get into it here. Now, this book, uh, it takes place in what in Star Trek has come to be known as an alternate universe or a parallel reality. Uh, this is not our crew, our in quote marks, uh, that we see in seasons one and two. This is a slightly different parallel universe, not as drastically different as the mirror universe, but just, you know, maybe one or two quantum realities away from our own. Uh, so I, I kind of want to throw this to Bruce because I'm curious when you figured out that this was in fact an alternate reality, because I'm really curious. I'm curious too, to see <laughs> if my hints were gathered. Well, okay. First of all, I thought, oh, oh no, I think uh, you're getting things confused or something. (laughs) Because I'm trying to remember what the first thing was. It wasn't uh, Landry. What was it before that? That made me think. Ensign Tilly and not in the CPT yet. Okay, so the Ensign Tilly thing came up. Yes, there was all that. And I was like, okay, this is taking place after season one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm with us. I'm with that on that. And then there was a meant then. Landry was mentioned. Yeah, there was like a game or or that no, what was it that was uh that you had they said, "Well, don't don't tell Landry or don't do that to Landry. She'll get upset." Or I was like, "Well, wait, she's dead." So, <laughs> that couldn't take place. But we have Ensign Tilly. We can't have both. No, nah, oh, that's a oh wow. Did Dave get it wrong? <laughs> right, Did that's the copy editors mess up. That's what I thought. I was like, uh, whatever." I, or maybe I'm just reading it wrong maybe they're still meaning she would have got upset so you, know, you missed a, detmer having eyebrows mm-hmm. i missed that then. <laughs> yes, I, did miss that. I missed that i mentioned it at lunch <laughs> okay i missed that part i'm trying to remember then there was something else that came up that i was like oh that's that's not right either I didn't mention ref- who the captain was for 60 pages. Right. And, they kept, mm. and they wouldn't mention the captain. So at this point, this is where I was getting at earlier. This is what, what I thought when they didn't mention with the captain, I said, oh, so this is when they returned to Earth at the end of season one. So there must have been interim captain for a while before they left to go to Vulcan to get the permanent captain. So maybe we won't know who this captain is. <laughs> and that's why I thought this is when it takes place is at the end of the last episode of season one. But before they are heading to Vulcan. But then Landry is mentioned and there was something else that was mentioned that didn't fit in. And I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, something weird. I forget. And I messaged Dan about it. (laughs) And and he's like, he's like, (laughs) I can't. He's like, keep reading until they said Captain Burnham. Then I'm like, okay, this is an alternate universe for sure. (laughs) But I was already thinking it might be. But at that point, I knew for sure. Believe it or not, it's not that alternate. Um, the, The big change in this universe, frankly, um, was that it didn't have interaction with uh, the mirror universe like yeah. the, the prime universe did. And Burnham didn't make the decision uh, at, the, at the Battle of the Binary Stars, so it became the standoff at the Binary Stars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that, those are mo- mostly the only differences. So, uh, well, I shouldn't say that because also the, the tardigrade was... Uh, and how uh, Strahl and um, and Stamets did that. But they were very, very minor differences. And it was important to me that the characters be kept mostly the same. 
Um, so, so yes, you haven't seen uh, Saru go through his, uh, you know, change uh, where he loses his. Uh, why am I blocking on the name? His ganglia. Thank yeah, you. The, the or anything yeah. like that. Um, so he's sort of the Saru that we saw before, um, but. Character-wise, just little tiny tweaks in the characters. I mean, my God, uh, we even know that they have that uh, Tracy Pollard has the same, you know, she hates pickles and she likes sushi, which <laughs> would be the same in the regular universe. Mm -hmm. So um, it was important to me that basically to say, hey, here's what might have happened if the Battle of the Binary Stars and the Klingon War didn't happen. So I'm I'm curious about that process then. So you make that decision that okay, these are the the fundamental differences in this universe and then did you just kind of like map it forward and imagine like what season 1 and 2 of Discovery would have been like in that universe and kind of put us there or how did that process go? It was almost deconstructed. So I I had to say okay, if if Burnham, because Burnham was about to be a captain in in the first episode, uh, Georgiou was talking about that. You know, it's time for your own ship. Um, and uh, I realized Tilly would not have been her roommate. They would not have had much interaction with she, with each other. She was uh, first a cadet and then an ensign, and quite frankly, um. Uh, her interaction would have been in some meetings where she had to give some data. Um, and I thought that was an interesting sort of thing to play off. Here's two people that would like each other, but now they're in very different positions. And how can I, how can I play off that? Um, and the rest of it was what, I didn't want to map out what had happened in this universe because one, that's giving away that it's alternate universe, but clearly something happened that allowed both Strahl and uh, Stamets to uh, traverse the mycelial network as the navigators. Um, I alluded to it. I didn't come right out and say it other than what they did was uh, possibly illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and they sort of got a waiver um, uh, because it was an emergency and I didn't want to get too deep into what the emergency was going to be because this is not how people don't talk to each other like that. They mm. don't hash up exactly what happened. They, they hit the high points and you don't want something that's so full of exposition that doesn't matter to the actual plot of the story. Um, but honestly, the, the real reason this alternate universe was created was to show the anguish and angst and uh, this sort of tragedy of Culber. Because the idea was, what happened to Culber? Where actually was he when he was stuck in the mycelial network? Mm -hmm. And what did that mean for him? Because it would have been boring if it was just a whole book about him in the mycelial network just by himself. I mean, right. you have to have him with the other characters in some way. Well, and also, if you look at how he came out of the network and how traumatized he was and how frightened he was and how he had lost himself, the thought was, uh, how did he get that way? And uh, in the, by the end of the book, I think it is revealed, um, hopefully more than subtly, that uh, he got that way because he's had this torturous existence for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. And it's sad, and yet we know it's a happy ending in the end. And by the way, thank God at the end of season two, they brought them together again. Because, <laughs> yeah. um, But I also wanted to say, what was it that caused him not to be with his Paul immediately after coming out, what was it that made that relationship strange? Yeah. And I think it was that Culber had really lost himself in a lot of ways. And while Paul was his anchor, uh, when he came back to Paul, Paul had learned something by losing uh, you. And I think, he, I think he became the Paul that you needed. And I think that scared you a little bit. Mm -hmm. until he sort of found himself again 
Um, and you know, his, his discussion with Cornwall, Cornwall, Cornwall. Well, yeah, now I've lost it. Cornwall. Um, you know, because she was a psychiatrist, um, really was helpful in sort of crafting how I sad this sounds so wrong, how I had to damage him to get him to the point where they could have that talk. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, yes. I, I actually recently was rewatching season two and even the first episode of season two, uh, the fact that Stamets is suddenly, not suddenly, but he's singing the praises of Cassilian opera. He now understands what it was that, that Hugh saw in it. And Hugh always believed that I would come around to it. And I have because, you know, of all this. And, and that got me to thinking that, yeah, it, it's not that this needed to happen, but like it, it, it took this to kind of smack Paul upside the head and realize what he had. And, and I, I don't know if I'm putting that in the right way, but it, it brought him around to being, like you said, the Paul that Hugh ended up needing, which I think is, which, beautiful. by the way, what a very human response. Your husband dies and you, didn't like something or you chided him about something that, uh, you know, so maybe he didn't like it or maybe he, you know, would jab more about how he didn't like it and then sort of falling into it and making it your own because it was something that your spouse cared about greatly. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very human response when someone loses a spouse. And quite frankly, I think him sort of being over, you know, saying he's done, pack up the equipment. I'm, you know, go do something else. I think that's a very human response too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Paul is a, Paul has become a human being thanks to the mycelial network <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah, definitely. If you look at where he was at the, the beginning of the series, um, jaded and acerbic and, and that sort of thing. And you compare that. Well, he can still be acerbic cause that's fun. He can be. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. like you compare it to where he is at the end and it's, you know, such a beautiful arc for this character over to, you know, relatively short seasons, shorter than what we're used to in Star Trek. I think that's just a beautiful character trajectory. They, 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 they do a lot of good character work. Um, like I say, there are, uh, there are, I wish each episode had like five more minutes, <laughs> but it's all, it's expensive <laughs> um, is the problem. I'm sure the writers wish they all had five more minutes too. Um, but, uh, I did, I did want to give some, uh, some love to some of the other characters. Uh, certainly, uh, like I say, Landry and, uh, Arium. Um, and I hope that showing Burnham as a captain, I was able to show her best self that I think she's probably moving toward, I'm guessing on the show. I, I don't, I can't imagine that they're going to, not eventually make her the captain. I have no inside info. It's what I would do because I actually really like her as a main character. I feel she has almost a melding of Kirk and Spock both. She has some of that impulsivity, but she also has that reason and logic. And uh, actually she's even got a little anger from McCoy in there. So she's, she's kind of put together and, um, uh, Aside from loving the actress and what she does with the part, um, I think it's a really, all of these are really good characters to me. I found them all interesting and complex. I wish I had been able to uh, dive into a few more of them. But the problem is, it is an esoteric sort of talky book as it is. And if I had taken a deep dive into every character, I think it would have uh, read more like a Wikipedia than a novel. <laughs> But that's one thing I loved about the book is that you did give so much to a lot of these different characters, these secondary characters that we don't get a lot of screen time with. And if anything, the thing that I walked away with this book is not just this love story and the emotion and everything that was involved, but just how this crew interacted, like you said, making Burnham the captain. I thought this is kind of where I want the show to go is like the, the crew feels established. What they went through in season one of discovery was really disruptive to them. And now they're just been starting to gel together as characters, but now you have them in an alternate universe where they, they were more on friendly terms in the sense that, 
when they started their mission, they didn't have someone who was commanding them that was from the mere universe. They had a chance to become friends and gel more together and felt more established as a crew. And, and Stamets is the mycelial uh, en- uh, navigator, basically. Engineer, navigator. He's not the chief engineer, as right. some people uh, like to call him. Had this closer relationship in, in the book with Burnham to the point where, you know, they're on a first name basis, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I'm they're actually probably on a somewhat of a first name basis as well in the in the normal universe. Um, but it's a different relationship because she started out as a specialist without rank and she, he was her boss at first um, and in a, like, you know, his acerbic way. Uh, but she's always been the boss to him as far as uh, as far as uh, he's concerned. And yet they got this relationship where they trust each other um, and like each other. In fact, like uh Stroll doesn't particularly like um, Captain Underwood, <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, is the name, I guess, of the of the Glenn, the captain from uh, Star Trek Online. Oh, oh okay. okay. I um, wonder where that came I from. don't play Star Trek Online, but but one of the uh, I think it was Dayton Ward who might have suggested it to me because, hmm. <laughs> okay. um, uh, you know, he's the keeper of all things. Uh, track in a lot of ways and the Glenn, that was the other thing i thought you got wrong early in the book when they said they right. got communication maybe from the glenn i'm like but the glenn's not around anymore <laughs> that, that was the other all one. these little hints i love that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah there i i tried to i tried to leave hints but not too many hints because i did want it to be a surprise when uh when burnham arrives on the bridge and someone says I think they actually, instead of Captain the Bridge, I think they, he says, I found the captain because <laughs> it was an emergency <laughs> and she was sent to go look for the captain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'd, 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 I'll ask you guys because I wrote it. Um, uh, did you find her a good captain? I'm hoping. I did. I ab- yeah. yeah. I ab- absolutely did. Um, one of the things that I, th- at, at first I was like, oh, she's the captain. I'm not sure how I feel about this, but then. Like I was thinking back to the very first episode of Discovery, right? Where Giorgio says, I think it's time that you had your own command. So, you know, Giorgio saw something in her and she'd been her first officer for, you know, a while. So she has that experience. And I think, I think some people watching Discovery tend to forget that, that, you know, she is a veteran of Starfleet. She was a commander for a number of years. She was in her captain's eyes, ready to become a captain so she was well Riker exactly on, on the Shenzhou. Yeah. And uh, Riker was more than ready to become a captain at some point. So, you know, Burnham, of course, it, it's and, and like you said, that kind of she's got that Vulcan logic center, but she's still got that what I call like the patented Burnham heart. Like she's she's a character with a lot of heart. And I think that yeah. combination made her a very strong captain. I felt like she was very much working with everyone and not just commanding them. And then she had to, and then when she had to step up and command and, and give direction, she did, but she wasn't so tough that she was just barking out orders. She was actually working together with her. Yeah. I wanted to make her a captain that they could respect that, but that uh, she accepted when, you know, she was open to hearing people, but at the same time, (laughs) Uh, she had her decisions to make. I think that's her relationship with uh, with Landry. Um, she doesn't necessarily always agree with Landry, but she respects Landry's opinion and she'll take her advice when she thinks it's warranted. Um, and she does know when to be the captain. Um, for instance, uh, there was a scene where the aliens in the book seem to be using mycelial weapons and it really ticked off Paul, who, by the way, saw this as his technology, Mm -hmm. which is ridiculous (laughs) in a lot of ways, considering the multiverse. And, um, you know, he was sort of lost in that sort of anger about that. And she just grabs him by the elbow, I think, if memory serves. And she says, these aren't your weapons. That's not your technology. And, you know, uh, she was uh, always talking about essentially the ticking clock that's going on, because to her, uh, 
She has to keep her crew stay safe and she has to get to Benicia colony. Mm-hmm. Those are, that's her mission. And, uh, um, she never lost sight of her mission, which I found to be very Starfleet. And I did want to make it a mission, you know, not they're going to some place to do a battle, but a very Starfleet mission of we're going to this place to cure people, to help people, to save people. Um, because, uh, I wanted, I wanted this to be a very Star Trek philosophy sort of book. And I think it turned out that way, especially since the aliens who were involved, um, it was, uh, I mean, they made first contact, um, with some new aliens that we'll probably never see again. Um, but, uh, uh, first contact is always a very interesting sort of thing to have happen. And I, it, it led to a lot of interesting, like, uh, it's, this is a, f- a fondness of mine. I love when the universal translator just isn't going to work for a while. Mm-hmm. And it gives them a real complication because very often, all of a sudden, the universal translators seem to work for everybody in TNG yeah. um, and instantly. And I liked that they had to sort of figure it out and see, hey, how how is this going to work? Because it was a completely different. I mean, if you don't have a frame of reference, how does the universal translator work? That's why I've always wondered, too. And I'm glad <laughs> that you didn't do that in here where it had to learn, because that actually makes the aliens feel more alien. And and it, it learned slowly so that the the translation sounded very strange. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the way, there was a, an Easter egg in there where I think he calls her an angel at some yeah. point. Yes. I was wondering <laughs> if that was purposeful. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> it was purposeful, but it has no meaning. Right. It was just me being, you know, just a wink um, at the because reader. I remember I read I read the scripts. I read the scripts for season two and then had to deal with the next several months of people suggesting who the red angel is. <laughs> of course. I cannot say anything um, because, you know, I'm under an NDA and and I'm just like, oh, my God, it's not the Borg. <laughs> um, Arium is not the Borg and 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 Burnham is the Red Angel. And why can't you see this? Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, I still have friends who having after season season two and after it was all done, I said, it's not the Borg. <sighs> I have no idea why I thought it was the Borg. And he says, I think it might end up being the Borg. I'm like. Oh my God. <laughs> well, because it goes into their bloodstream and their nano things and they're green colored. So it must be the <laughs> boar. <laughs> uh, nanotechnology is sort of around now. So <laughs> I guess the, the board could be any time now. No, I mean, that that's funny that you say that because, you know, that stuff I found frustrating as someone who didn't know <laughs> what the end point was. So I can't imagine how frustrating that would be uh, to you who knows where this is all going. So that's funny. And knows where it's going. Um, but at the same time, loved watching it, mm-hmm. which I think is, uh, uh, again, it's, it's something that the director and the actors, by the way, whoever, I don't know who's doing the casting for the show. I don't pay attention to that part of the credits. The casting on this show is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Anson Mount as Pike oh, man. and Ethan Peck as Spock killed it. Rebecca yes. Romaine as number one killed it. Yeah. Um, and every, uh, just every, uh, uh, the Admiral to, to the guy who played, um, I'm forgetting his name. He played the section 31 guy who got, uh, Oh, um, Alan Van Sprang. Yes. But who, what the, the uh, character's Leland. name? Leland. He was amazing. Cause you kind of liked him <laughs> and you kind of felt for him. And you kind of was nervous about them. I mean, it was the casting on this show, not just for guest stars, but for the principals, obviously, is amazing. Mm-hmm. And they, they raise the uh, – there's a scene in, a, in uh, I think it's Burnham Quarters, where she's talking to Amanda. And uh, Burnham sort of admits that she pushed Spock away on purpose. And Amanda's reaction is one – of a pissed mother so pitch perfect that she's like, she kisses her on the cheek and it's like, I'm going to go save my son. But the underlying comment there is, I love you. 
but later we're going to have words. <laughs> it was played yeah. just perfectly. Yeah. yeah. And I just, uh, the season two, like I say, blew me away. No, there's definitely some amazing stuff. And like you said, the casting always impresses me with these shows. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of actors I've seen in other roles that I, you know, was like, oh, them in Star Trek. Oh, them in that role. Oh my God, that works. Like, you know, who'd have thought that the, you know, sexy assassin from 24 would play Spock's mother so perfectly. I just, that blows my mind. I love it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, actors are, um, I mean, they're professionals and they think about this sort of stuff. In fact, I guess uh, Kirsten had given uh, Wilson Cruz some, uh, some info, info that a book was being written about uh, him and, and Stamets. Although I, I want to say that this book is more almost a more Culber book than it is a Stamets book. It's yeah, certainly a Calmette's mm-hmm. book yeah. um, because it's about their, their love. Um, but uh, she'd given him just a couple of ideas of what was going on. And I saw one of those interviews with him during the season when he came back and it sounded to me like he knew what the, you know, the basics of the story was. And I quickly emailed Kirsten. I said, does he know? And she said, yeah, I told him a little bit. So obviously it, it might've helped just the, with not reading the book, but just the idea of what we were working on might've informed his, his acting a little bit. Um, I don't know. I don't know when it was filmed. I would hope so. And again, that has nothing to do with me because it was just the idea seed that Culber's uh, been through hell. Um, and sort of a living hell um, or a, 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 a death that was endless, hence the title Dead Endless. And I think, uh, I think Ephraim, we haven't talked about Ephraim, but uh, I think Ephraim actually asked, is dead endless? Mm-hmm. Um, which is where the title comes from. Um, do you want to talk about Ephraim? I would yes. love, I actually have him in here as a, as a, uh, a full topic, topic here. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> because, yeah, I'm very curious about this character because we've seen him in uh, the show uh, referred to as Ripper by Landry, yes. and that name has kind of stuck. And the other thing that I notice, and I, I know, you know, one doesn't really have anything to do with the other, but I notice an upcoming Short Treks episode coming later this month. Uh, actually probably already aired by the time this episode comes out. Now that I think about That's it, right. uh, yeah. Ephraim and dot the animated yes. one features this tardigrade as well. So yeah, I'm really curious about this character and he's oddly charming is kind of how I describe him. And I'm, I'm curious what it was like to write him and, and how that kind of formed. And I, I will say that I like him, but I don't like him, mm. but I could like him. <laughs> and I didn't like him, but I will yeah, like, I like him. But I will like him. Um, he, his, his character, obviously, um, Ephraim was the name given the Tardigrade character when they thought they might have him as a member of the crew, mm-hmm. which uh, was early on in, uh, in de- when they were still developing the show. Um, and the problem with that, of course, was the CGI to have you know it's one thing to have makeup and then have eyes blink cgi occasionally um it's another thing to do a whole character cgi and make it look movie grade like they want star trek to look and so i think that's probably why it was shelved but the idea was always hanging out there and um we needed someone to be able to uh, talk with Culber when he was in the network because otherwise he's just alone, sort of ranting to himself and crying. Um, and I thought, uh, I think it's Men in Black 3. Is that the time travel one? Yes. Okay. I don't know why I, I know that, but it is. <laughs> I think there is a, I don't remember the character's name, but there was a character who could see all possibilities. Hmm. And if you remember correctly, he was like, oh, he didn't leave the tip. This is the one where an asteroid hits. Right. And the, they came, he came back quickly and left the tip and the asteroid avoided. 
And he was a very quirky, sort of a sweet, but almost oblivious character because he could see all of these different things. And I thought, that's probably my brief to a certain degree. Because if you can, obviously, when he is in a, I'm trying not to use language from the book, but I guess I should. When he's in a clearing, when Ephraim is in a clearing, he does not, he does not see all and know all. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But when he's in the network, the network connects him to all of these places and he sees it all and it's simultaneous and his brain can handle it, which is why the shared DNA that he shared with uh, Stamets, most of the Stamets's, um, allows them to navigate it and sort of uh, uh, handle it. Um, but that DNA was not given to Culber. He can't handle where he is and what's happened to him. Um, and so, and yet, uh, Ephraim kind of helped cause him by giving Paul the power to sort of create him in the network. And uh, he feels responsible for, uh, for Culber um, because Ephraim is kind he's curious and kind and he doesn't necessarily like what he did to Landry. He acted out of, um, it's also very strange to him because from Ephraim's point of view, okay, yeah, I, I killed one of them, but the rest of them exist because as Culber sort of suggests to him, they're shadows of this form. They are splinters of what he considers of that he considers Paul they, even though he tries to dumb it down for Culber and say he he considers Culber they, which by the way is why he told Stamets early on and Stamets whispered it in season one. Uh, there's a clearing in the forest. That's how they go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and immediately and, thought of that when the term clearing came up in the book. And I was like, oh, I'd love that. That line to me made almost no sense. And I realized, yeah, there, what, what the writers were doing was just having him sort of rant so that he seemed delusional. But my thought was, what if that means something? Mm -hmm. What if that's meaningful somehow? And um, I wanted it to dawn on uh, Culber that he's the they, and eventually he does. And by the way, Culber is a little angry uh, about Ephraim. There's a, a, a toward the end. There's a slight moral discussion about um, Ephraim's giving people power by sharing his DNA and allowing people to do this because he thinks all of a sudden he's thinking not just of his universe, but all of these multiple universes because Ephraim admits that he did this. And in fact, the, uh, the Malagank who are the aliens in it, uh, Culber asks, so did you give them this too? Even though they've had it for hundreds of years. Um, and he says, I, I have, and I haven't, and I, and I will, and I won't because to him, there's just no other way to say, because all of these things are happening for him at the same time and yet haven't happened. And yet, he can't relate it to any other way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Ephraim doesn't think of the moral implications of it, but Culber did, which I also thought was very human and very Starfleet. Um, mm -hmm. I really like Culber. I've, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I liked him on the show, but I, I like that he was able to go through hell and yet was sort of still grounded enough to ask a moral question, at least grounded enough when he was given the ability with either Ephraim's help or a clearing. Mm -hmm. By the way, the clearing worked for him because it was a moment that he could comprehend as opposed to all of these moments trying to come into his head from the network. Right. But now Stamets has that, all these moments come because we see the alternate Stamets and isn't he seeing things from our Stamets from his relation with Culber? The only eventually? thing that he was able to see from our Stamets is what, well, actually, it was uh, it was it was Culber that was able to see 
the alternate Stamets history with him. And that's because Ephraim allowed them to share their thoughts, Mm -hmm. which is one of the things, mind you, I had to make these, uh, make Paul fall in love with you over a four hour period, Mm -hmm. (laughs) essentially. (laughs) And to do that, I had to have a reason why they would be so close. And by sharing their thoughts and that that's a certain level of intimacy. And of course, poor Paul has been hearing um, Hugh's voice, not knowing who he is Um, and not getting that when he was saying, Paul, it's you. He was reading that as Paul. It's, it's Y O U. It's you, (laughs) which made no sense to him um, because he had forgotten that you Culber existed because it was just some guy who was rude to him and called him an asshole. Right. Speaking of which, I, I do love where that ends up in this alternate universe where, you know, Paul eventually contacts Hugh, the, the Hugh that's living on the USS Hood as the chief medical officer. That whole scene I thought was really charming. And I, I love that he's opening up because of his experience here to this other Hugh. And, you know, the other Hugh, you know, he's clearly kind of interested he's like who's this cute guy who's oh i kind of remember you from oh yeah you gave that talk and and i i watched that and i thought that was a really interesting way to leave that also that he was more he was more memorable to that you culber the the one on the hood um for his intelligence than for his rudeness Mm -hmm. um i wanted to make sure that there was a basis there and uh, for them to have a relationship. So I think you can imagine that that Paul and that you get together. Um, and if I, if I had to write a sequel in my head right now, not that that is, you know, going to happen, but um, uh, I think that what Paul would find is that that you is the right one for him too. And he would thank the you that he met for the ability to do that. But I, I can see him absolutely falling in love with, um, uh, with that you, which by the way, I, there's a, a line toward the end there where he asks, do you still hate Cassilian opera? Um, <laughs> and this is a line that I put in uh, for the Star Trek fans who are so rabid, they'll never read it because they won't read a Discovery novel, are so rabid against certain versions of things. And it's just, what a, what a, it's something like, what a waste of energy it is to hate something which someone else loves. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes. when it's, especially when it's a subjective thing. So the thought is in there. And, and then he says, no, I've learned my lesson. And I think, I th- I think you says uh, you don't seem like the same Paul Stamets and um, and Paul says you're not the same uh, you but I won't I won't hold it against you <laughs> because it's not the same you no but mm-hmm. now I'm concerned because like you said I mean I would think they're probably perfect for each other but what if you know Paul's like oh this you. I like him. I just don't like him as much as the other. One. <laughs> well, that that was actually that was actually uh, Culber, who is really, uh, except for the very end, which is just a, a flash to what happened in season two when mm-hmm. he was recovered. Because I didn't want to leave it on such a sad note. Um, uh, Culber is mainly the only canon character, you know, the the only prime universe character that's in most of the book. Other than Ephraim, I guess. Yeah. Um, but uh, he, he actually has a, a, a tremendous amount of guilt because he likes this Paul better than the one that was sort of war-torn. Um, war changed his Paul. Now, granted, his death sort of changed Paul back or made him a, a different person. Um, you know, we all change, especially through events and, and tragedies and, and things that we go through. But this was a much softer Paul, and he was very attracted to it. But, uh, I mean, he actually, uh, in his mind, from his point of view, it's asks, um, is, is my love for my husband fungible? Can I just transfer it to another person because he looks and acts and is 
essentially the same Paul, but a little bit better. It was really, a, 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 again, here's Calder with a sort of a moral dilemma. This isn't the man he married. Right. It's mm-hmm. like he's cheating on his husband. Yeah. With, I guess, a clone, sort of. Yeah. Um, and in fact, when they did the, the, the tests, the, you know, psychosimulator and all the tests that Starfleet has, they basically said that he's essentially the same you Culber, but they show the same variances that you would in a twin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I, I think if I had just had you sort of accept it and want to st- definitely want to stay with this universe's Paul. And he did want to stay, but it wasn't an easy thing for him. I didn't, I don't feel that if he had stayed with that Paul, I'm not sure that they would have gotten together. Um, you know, any, I don't think it would have been a lasting relationship. I'm not sure that you could have handled that. Not and remember, um, you know, his Paul still. Yeah. Cause he would constantly be comparing yep. the two and realizing, oh, I feel like I'm with Paul, but I'm not. And the more that he discovers that there's differences in Paul, the more he starts to realize that it's not Paul, it's somebody different. And it does feel like you've left your loved one for somebody else when that wasn't the intent. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's one of the ways in which I unfortunately had to torture Culber. Um, because again, I wanted to explain why is he traumatized? Why does he, he basically is sort of PTSD when he comes back. Um, and I'll ask this question, both of you. I, I think I, I, I alluded it to it with Dan. I got to ask you, how many Pauls has he been through this with? <laughs> because yeah. Ephraim made it clear that he would lead him to clearings whenever he could. Yeah, and I took from that that there could have been other incidences with other Pauls. He eventually gets to the right Paul, but I did get that idea that there could have been other instances like this. And then I wondered, you know, it sounds like he doesn't even remember them. No, because his brain can't remember all of this stuff. So it it loses itself very quickly. In fact, he, at both the beginning of the book and the end of the book, he asks Ephraim who he is. Um, And, uh, you know, are you torturing me? Let me free of this place. Um, the only things that he sort of can remember is that the Jossep burn him and that the yield tree bark will protect him. Those are, those are things that he needs to live. And of course, what's the other thing he remembers is Paul. Um, but, uh, put a number on it. How many Pauls has he met? <laughs> yeah. Nine okay, I'm going to say, <laughs> I, I'm going to say 47. The, the actu- <laughs> Uh, Dan is right, and that it's it's actually infinite. It would be infinite because at the end, when Ephraim, you know, uh, basically, I, I think he uh, Culber asks something about you know how long and until I get home or something like that, and Ephraim just sadly says, "Time here is in- infinite," and so uh, it was literally an eternity. Um that at least from his perspective that he was stuck in the network for Paul, it was eight months or whatever it was, but you know, his Paul, um, but for, for Culber, uh, he was in hell quite, quite literally. So let me ask you this. Sure. Are there multiple Culbers in the network? Um, I thought about that actually, <laughs> and I'm going to say no. Um, okay. I would, so this only happened in one of the universes that this Culber came in. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna say probably not. Although I did speculate that it could be possible in other parts of the network there are other Culbers, um, but uh, each universe being a little bit different and some being a lot different, um, I wanted to I didn't want to actually write that in the book that there were other Culbers because that makes this less special. And I wanted right. this one man seeking and getting back to his true love to be the focus of the story. Um, and I will say this. I'm, I'm a straight guy who's writing um, a, a, a non-straight, essentially. I mean, it's not a romance novel, but it's a love story. Mm-hmm. And someone asked me early on, uh, you know, 
do you feel comfortable doing that from your perspective? And I said, uh, well, I'm married, so I understand love. And it's just love between two people. There's no real difference. And uh, I feel far more comfortable writing it in a Star Trek setting than I would a modern setting because I don't have the experience of a gay man who at my age would have grown up in the 80s and 90s when things were different. Um, and I don't think I could have written that book because it's an experience, at least not without a lot of research. It's an experience that I haven't had and I wouldn't have felt uh, comfortable relating a modern day gay experience to an audience um, and not feeling like I was, uh, I don't know, not being able to express it to its fullest. Um, right. But I felt comfortable doing this because in the Star Trek universe, you know, 300 years from now, it's like every other relationship. And I have a relationship. And so I did not see them as two gay men. I just saw them as two people in love. Um, and yet, it's very nice to have a Star Trek book out that has been published that is um, the story of, of, of two gay men who are in love with each other, which there have certainly been um, that portrayed to a lesser degree in, uh, you know, in other Star Trek media, um, you know, SCE and some of the other books, um, and to a, a great, wonderful job done. But this is the first book that really is, I think, just fully about a love story like that. Um, that really underpins the whole story. Like without that, there is no story. Right. That there would be, there'd be nothing to write about if, uh, if um, you Culber and Paul Stamets weren't in love. And by the way, I was, I knew what was coming and I hated the scene where he moved out of, uh, you moved out of Paul's quarters. Oh, it just was gut wrenching. It's so heartbreaking. Absolutely. <laughs> by the way, they played the scene so great. They're such good actors. Um, this is why I really hope, having sent the Meacha book, that. Um, and I, I asked uh, Wilson Cruz. I said, "Give me feedback. I want to know what you feel I got right and what you feel I got wrong." And I'm sincere in this. And bless his heart, he said, uh, "He said I can feel that you're sincere in it, and I will be totally honest with you." So now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you're nervous. <laughs> I am nervous. I want it. I want. I, I, I want people in general to like the book. But I especially want Anthony Rapp and Wilson Cruz to like the book. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. Because they live these characters and I had to live them somewhat, uh, certainly in prose form. And oh my God, did I get it right? <laughs> you yes. know? Yeah. I want to yeah. know. Because you're reflecting back their performances because you're writing their performances into the book. Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, there was a... Uh, I, I looked at little mannerisms uh, that they do. I tried to copy those. You obviously have to see the show to see them play in. Um, I tried to do that with all of them. Um, uh, uh, Saru was easy. Tilly was rather easy because uh, she talks a lot. <laughs> and I love I lo I love Tilly. Um, and I think the hardest ones to write from a... Uh, trying to get their character right as to what we've seen perspective were the ones that we just haven't seen much. Um, Arium was a little hard. Uh, I probably said too many times that her voice was artificial, I felt, in reading over it. Uh, but there's not much to go on there other than she has sort of a tinny voice and she has movements that are a little off. Um, Landry was super hard because we had very little, I mean, we saw the mirror universe of her, but I ignore that. It for, as far as this is concerned. Um, and so I sort of had to build on what uh, the actress seemed to be projecting in those first couple of episodes. And hopefully I got it right. Um, Tracy Pollard, uh, Dr. Pollard, we haven't seen that much of, um, but uh, I love that actress. And um, I tried to make her a little bit snarky because I get some snark from her. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what people think of that. As for Owo, Owo and Detmer, Owoshikun and Detmer, 
Um, I didn't dive into them too much other than we see the, and Bryce and Jen Reese. I just, there was not enough time to go into everyone and, and not have, uh, but I, but I, but all of them are really good. And by the way, there were, there were places where I did give all of them a little bit and I just, it, it wasn't working for the pacing and it had to come out, um, which is too bad. Um, although Ariam and Jen scene, uh, where she explains why she's called Ariam, um, and I'll leave that spoiler for people. Uh, well, we were, we're in a spoiler episode, but <laughs> um, that was that was a somewhat longer scene that got trimmed down, but works very well trimmed down. Um, Scott Pearson is a great uh, copy editor, and he uh, I, we said this is too long. We know what, what, what do we do with it? Uh, and he, and he rejiggered it around and, and made it a really good scene. Um, but I think her telling that story to Jen hopefully reveals something about him too. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course, uh, Landry revealing stuff to Arium hopefully reveals something about both of them as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, regarding little, regarding little character um, quirks, I guess, things like that. There was, there was one thing you had Saru do a couple times that I was just like, ah, this feels perfect. Which is where he like just puts his hands on his sides and kind of, I don't know. Yes, how it's, to that, it's that hand on the side thing where he's, you know, like leaning back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, or smoothing a, his shirt. Yeah. You just a little bit that. like further down. There's, there's a scene in brother, the first episode of season two, where he does it very, like you see that perfectly where they're doing the sound off around, around the bridge. And he goes, Saru, just Saru. And he does that. And <laughs> like, that's yes. what I pictured. And I was like, Oh, like Saru leapt off the page for me when you had him do that a couple times. So I was like, well, thank you. Perfect. I watched it several times <laughs> and tried to pick out, you know, some of, some of their mannerisms. Um, and Saru, I love. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I especially like his, his verbiage, his language usage. And in fact, um, God, what it, in the very end, um, they're talking, it's Burnham and he, and, um, Giorgio uh, and Giorgio, yeah, and Giorgio <laughs> says something. I forget what some, my wayward children re returned or something like that, and he just says nonsense. <laughs> and it's because <laughs> you know they didn't go away; they're still there. And uh, I think Burnham leans over to to um, Giorgio and says something like, "If we get him really angry, he'll say poppycock." <laughs> <laughs> and and he says that's a perfectly acceptable word when used in the proper context or something like that. Oh um, man, I, I'm and really I can glad. see him saying that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm really glad you brought up that scene because I wanted to just highlight that one quickly as well. Uh, that is one of my favorite parts of this book in a book full of favorite parts. Oh, well, thank you. But it really, it feels like the road not taken. Like if things had not gone the way they did in season one of discovery, I would have loved to have seen this trio of characters like this. And, um, you know, as much as I, I love the fact that we have Michelle Yeoh in the, the emperor Giorgio character, I just, I'm so sad that we lost captain Giorgio in that, in that first uh, two part episode and that we don't have her, you know, leading a Giorgio series as that character instead of section 31. I'm sure section 31 will be great and I'm looking forward to it, but Oh, I love the prime Giorgio. And I'm just, anytime we get a little bit of her and especially with these two other characters, that dynamic was just so perfect. Thank you. I, I really liked that scene. Uh, Kirsten, uh, when she read it, uh, was very kind about that scene saying that that felt like those characters, especially, um, because, you know, as they were, uh, previous to the war and everything, which was the goal to make it, you know, like the war had never happened. And, um, I, I do like Michelle Yeoh as Emperor Giorgio, be, even though I don't want to, cause I don't want to like, you know, someone who's basically a, a murderer. 
um, you know, several times over in a, in, in that universe. Although I think she's quite showed that, um, she does what she has to do to survive. And in that universe, she had to do that. And they've definitely tried to soften her character and the way she cares about Burnham and all of that. And, um, I am, uh, w- looking forward to the, um, uh, to the section 31 show mainly because she's so awesome, but yeah, the softer Giorgio is nice. She cares about these people. She put them together in the hopes that they would, um, they would work well together. Um, she sort of had a hunch. Um, and I really did what I love, uh, what Kirsten Beyer did with it, Cause I think it was one of her episodes, but all of the staff writers, they're all included in making Saru and Burnham really brother sister types um, that they, they really, they've got come to really deeply care about each other. And I wanted to mirror that in this book. I wanted to say that's going to happen in any universe, in any universe, these two people are going to be very close. So I tried to make them especially close in the book and uh, hopefully that played off well. Although um, I, I did, uh, what was it? Uh, she, he is, he is her confidant and vice versa. And she, he comes in and asks her, you know, how you're doing? And she says, I'm looking for grounding, Saru. And it's the only person on that ship that she would say that to, that she would admit a vulnerability to because he knows her so well and vice versa. Yeah. And that's what I was saying about earlier. I love how close these characters are. And I did pick up that felt like a brother sister relationship more so than what we've seen or we're starting to see more of in the series, but this is totally established in this novel. I, I think, I think when we visit his home world, but just before we visit his home world, when he's getting sick because he thinks he's using his losing his ganglia and that means he's going to die. And he, he asks her to use the, the knife. I forget the name of the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I see that relationship and I was like, bam, I'm there. That's, that's, it. that's, that's, that's what I need to show. These people are close. Um, there's one Easter egg you have not found yet. Ooh. Uh-oh. And it's at the, almost at the very end. And hmm. I'll see if you can think about it. Hmm. hmm. There was one that, that we haven't brought up. Um, that's from earlier in the book that I particularly liked. And I think you and I discussed this, um, what we call on the other side of the page before oh, we started recording. Yes. Um, and that was the uh, Axanar, uh, Captain Garth, and the you know. Well, uh, yes, <laughs> the 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 battle, the the what happened to to Garth um, uh, is now, I guess, in a a book that is close to canon as a, a book can get, uh, since it was you know uh, worked on with um, the people who are writing canon. Um, uh, it's about uh, the Antos mm-hmm. uh, disaster. Uh, where he tries to commit genocide um, and uh, he renames uh, his science vessel, the Heisenberg um, into uh, the Ares and tries to, you know, take over. Um, And of course, Starfleet would never have a vessel named the Ares. Uh, There is no Starfleet vessel that I know of that is named for a God of war. That would not happen in Starfleet. Uh, Even, as they went to war in the, in the, in the canon uh, Klingon war, vessels were not named. Uh, the, the Starfleet ideal was attempted to be upheld no matter what. Right. And so I just wanted to, to fit that in. Um, and, uh, and in fact, in previous novels, uh, uh, Garth uh, ha- was the captain of the Heisenberg. Um, so it also fits in with some former book canon, but yeah, it's, it's a dig at that whole Axnar debacle, it's a <laughs> debacle, 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 debacle. Um, uh, because, uh, it's, it's just a pity, uh, to see someone trying to make money off Star Trek, uh, without a license, basically. Well, regarding the, the one later in the book, I see Bruce feverishly flipping pages there. Well, I'm just like, I'm <laughs> toward something. the end. 
I remember something like, and I remember I was going to go back and reread it because I thought there was a hint of something that they were getting ready to go on a mission. They got a signal. Oh, or yeah. They were like, right. And I was like, wait, wait, that means something. And I was going to go back and reread that. And I'm, I was trying to do that now. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I was waiting for them to say seven signals of unknown origin. But, but right. They, That's why did, I wondered. Didn't do I that. Didn't, so. I wanted to leave it vague in case, in case CBS had didn't want to do that for some reason. So um, I just said, I'll just make it vague and sort of allude to it. But one could read into it that that was, that the sphere is going to happen in this universe too. Yeah. And that uh, that will be the end of mycelial travel um, here too, in a different way, obviously, because you've still got the Glen. Um, but how's it going to happen? So. Um, I just wanted to suggest that uh, maybe Burnham's future is always in the future, no matter what universe she's in. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't want to, uh, I, I didn't want to annoy the powers that be in a way, I guess, right. by, by treading off what was essentially their story, <laughs> um, which, uh, and I also didn't want to make it so blatant that people were like, oh my God, so there's going to be another book. Um, Because there's no plans for a, let's see what happens with the Red Angel in this universe. (laughs) Because I don't think we'll ever see this universe again. Um, But but again, really the point of the novel was to do two things. One, what if that Klingon war had never happened? And two, and more importantly, what happened to Culber and why is he so damaged? Um, And uh, it's very sad um, what happened to him. But obviously, it works out in the end. Especially, I'm very much waiting for season three to see if their relationship is going to be. It can't. I would assume it can't be instantly healed by him saying we're family and coming back together. They're going to have some problems probably, and I hope that uh, I hope that they have some problems because drama is interesting, and problems are drama. <laughs> but at the same time, so long as it ends up happy, I don't want them to. I don't want them to split. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. For sure. Especially after this book, because I'm saying they're soulmates. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, they can't ruin it. This, this, you know, you got to just make sure that all the writers in the writer's room have read this and realized that this is canon. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, Kir- Kirsten's read it. Um, but uh, the truth is, is that uh, canon is what's on screen and they could undo anything that's in my book with a snap of their fingers. Of course, the problem is, is that 99% of this book (laughs) takes place in an alternate universe. So it's unlikely to happen (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, because uh, really none of the characters are the ones that we know other than Afferman Culber. And by the way, I did ask, I have not read the script for Afferman dot, but I did ask if there's anything in there that, that would, you know, conflict with what I've written. And they said, no, uh, but at the same time, I made sure to modify the, the script a little bit so that Ephraim doesn't know if he's the only Ephraim. Hmm. Um, he, he is, uh, Ephraim is sort of clueless about his own origins, which I think is interesting in itself. I could write a book just about Ephraim and his adventures, which by the way, since the idea was originally to put him in Starfleet, I did have him mention that. In in one of the universes, he's in Starfleet. Yeah, I caught that little. There's a little uh, hint of that. I thought that was excellent yeah. as well. Because why not? Why not? Uh, look, the truth is, and I know st- some Star Trek fans will rail at me for this. Star Trek is stories, and it's not real, and um, uh, they're all just stories, all of them. Whether you get the continuity perfectly right or you don't. All questions of of continuity need to be addressed to, as I've said in the past, Captain James R. Kirk of the (laughs) United Space Probe Agency, United Earth Space Probe Agency, um, because everything changed um, because it's a TV show and we're just trying to entertain people in the books and they're just trying to entertain people on TV Mm -hmm. or movies. (laughs) Well, I guess Mm, I'm sorry. It's all real. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wish it would be. I was just letting that go, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I would love it if it were real. I absolutely would. Um, I but 
uh, my hope is, is that this inspires, not my book, but Star Trek in general, inspires the people of today and tomorrow to build that future if we can. And I'm not just talking about spaceships, but a future of equality and empathy and being united and and taking care of each other. I think that's one of the things that Star Trek speaks to. And uh, it is lacking in our world sometimes a lot. Here, here. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, kind of the last thing I just wanted to make a comment about this book. We've been we've been covering all of the discovery novels with the respective authors as they come out. And we've always made the comment that none of the novels actually take place on discovery, you know, during the show. And we were excited for this one because, oh, this one finally does. And then we get it and it actually kind of doesn't. So you're, you're slipping under the wire there again in another way, which I just think yes is and really no. cool. And that <laughs> I do have that final scene That's that is true, actually yeah. from, uh, from, from the show. So it does take place. Part of it, a little part of it takes place in our <laughs> prime universe. And um, it also um, you know, takes place on the discovery because that's where our Paul found our you. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess, uh, like I say, a lot of them have been flashbacks or not on the, on the discovery and all of that. And, uh, I didn't really think about it as I was writing it, but yeah, this, <laughs> and this takes place entirely either in the mycelial network or on the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. it's a battle episode sort of, it is yeah, yeah absolutely. just in an alternate universe. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it actually, but it's true. And by the way, uh, it's a smaller ship than, um, than I, than it is on screen. <laughs> Cause I had to sort of do a little bit of a dive into how many decks are there and where is engineering and all of that. And in comparison to like the constitution class or certainly the galaxy class, it's, it's definitely smaller. I still don't understand the whole turbo lift thing, but I didn't put that in the book. <laughs> yeah. I don't get that either. <laughs> Me either. It's visually exciting. Yeah, There's also is. no whooshing in space. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I can forgive a lot just because it, it's like a friend of mine asked as he's watching Star Trek, he's been a mild fan, but he's going through a rewatch of stuff. And he said, why, why, why are there still no seatbelts after all of these years? And I said, because it's visually exciting to see people move from side to side and be thrown out of their chairs. And if they're all just buckled in, it's boring. And that really is yeah. the reason. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess, uh, are there any final uh, things you'd like to say about the book or uh, things um, you want to well, leave us one? If they've listened to all of this, they've probably read it. I certainly <laughs> hope they've enjoyed hope it. so. Um, and, you know, uh, and if they haven't enjoyed it, I'm always curious to know why, because I can always improve, you know, my writing. And I'm, I mean, I'm not open to someone saying, well, this sucked and I hate you, um, uh, especially if it's for some... <laughs> you know, weirdly political or a uh, strange reason like that. But if somebody says, Hey, you know, I didn't think you got this, get this character right. Or, you know, I'm curious about what people think and, and always open to that. And there are Amazon reviews. I can be reached at Dave Gallanter on Twitter. Um, you know, I have a, a fairly large uh, internet footprint. People can find me. I think I actually put at the end of the book, my Twitter handle. And um, I'm curious to know what folks thought. I was very relieved that you guys uh, seemed to enjoy it because the whole point, you know, it's not a big pew pew book. There's not a lot of pew pew. Um, I think, in fact, I don't think, uh, I mean, some hand phasers go off, but I, I don't think the ship's phasers fire at all or anything like that. Um, and I think sometimes Star Trek is at its best like that. Um, I think the whole here's, I love Wrath of Khan, but I don't want every episode to be, you know, ships fighting each other and, you know, photon torpedoes and all of that. Yeah. Well, speaking for myself, I, I love the novel. And as I've said before, I love the cerebral stuff with Star Trek. So this really just kind of hit all my buttons. Uh, so definitely one of my favorites. Same Great. here. Thank it's, you. Uh, um, 
I don't know if I should say this out loud, but I think it's my favorite Discovery novel. Ooh. So far. Wow. Nice. That's, I'm in amazing company considering the you other are. S- Discovery writers, uh, novel writers who I, I believe are in, in general better writers than I am. Ah. Um, but I should <laughs> say that, you know, this book is what it is f- for. Uh, uh, I, I said in the acknowledgments, there's a lot of people that go into sort of hashing out details and helping me. Um, and so Kirsten Beyer, of course, um, and Dayton Ward, um, uh, and uh, Scott Pearson, the copy editor, and the senior editor, um, uh, Ed Schlesinger, was um, really helpful and fantastic. Um, and I can't thank him enough. Um, everybody was awesome. Dayton was more on the advice side. <laughs> um, because he's, uh, you know, he's done this himself many times and it was more just like he was the one who suggested Deb Underwood. I actually had the captain originally an Andorian from, uh, Kirsten Mike Johnson's, uh, comic book that introduced, um, Strahl and Stamets to Starfleet. He had seen their uh-huh. lecture and by the way, one of the scenes that's remembered in the book in flashback is from that comic changed a little bit because it happened in a different universe. Mm -hmm. So there is some coordination to make all of this, you know, sort of work and fit and be, well, not, not one universe, but in this case, the multiverse. Exactly. Right. Yep. (laughs) Perfect. Well, I guess uh, if you would like to let our listeners know where they can find you online and and kind of stalk you and maybe (laughs) if there's anything else coming out uh, that they'd be interested in checking out. I have nothing else I'm currently working on um, because I do have a day job and I write in my spare time. And it does take a lot of time away from family and everything. There's nothing. There's nothing worse than uh, saying to a little kid, "Honey, you got to leave because I got to work." Because hmm. by the way, you can't work with them in the room because they they don't shut up for a minute because um, <laughs> they're little kids and they don't right. understand really what working is other than you're sitting in a computer. Um, and uh, so I'm at Dave Gallanter on Twitter. You can probably find me on Facebook. I, I I don't have a a writer page or a fan page or anything, but I accept friend requests and you won't get kicked out unless you're rude. Um, and uh, uh, people can contact me there and reach out to me. I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to respond to questions. Um, and uh, I, I love Star Trek fans. So um, it's never, it's never a burden to talk to them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and talking to us about this excellent book that I hope if you're listening at this point, you have read it. But if you haven't, please go pick it up and read it because it yes, is excellent. It. Even if you've heard all of these spoilers, hopefully <laughs> there's still something in there for you to enjoy. Absolutely. Um, including uh, Tilly uh, standing on a console and singing with uh, old McDonald with a bunch of aliens. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that part. Oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> Which by the way, that was originally build me up buttercup, but uh, oh my God. <laughs> it's that's, that's too new and not public domain. So they would have oh, had to pay okay. the author of it, I think. So we changed it. <laughs> Which by oh, the way, no, I love it. it. It worked out better with old McDonald's. Um, and the, the aliens answering E-I-E-I-O back. Exactly. Oh. That was perfect. <laughs> Assuming that it was Burnham's farm. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, we've heard She's so much about your farm or something. That was great. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you guys liked the book. And thank you for, uh, thank you for talking to me and, and spreading the word that you enjoyed it. And hopefully we sell a few. I was really excited about this book because on the cover, it's, a big profile of Stamets and a little one of Colbert. So I'm thinking this is a Stamets novel, but as we mentioned, it's more of a Colbert novel than a Stamets novel. And Mm -hmm. not that, you know, I mean, it's both, but I, we're getting a lot more Colbert than I thought, you know, a lot more. And so I really enjoyed those two characters in this book. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what's really fun is I actually just recently rewatched Saints of Imperfection, which is the whole episode with Culber in the mycelial network. And it's amazing how many little points in this novel connect to that story. It's really, there's a lot of attention paid to 
all the little things in that episode that make this novel make a lot of sense and retroactively make that episode a lot cooler as well. So I think this is a good novel and, um, yeah, some really adds some really cool stuff to the, the discovery universe. It really does. Yes. Excellent. Well, it's been a lot of fun talking about the mycelial network today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing on this network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, continuing mission. Why they killed that officer, what they have to do with Project Perseus. Can I just, can I just throw my two cents worth in and say, I I know who they are. They're Smurfs. Oh, if only. From the planet Smurfia. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me I'm right. (laughs) If you insist. Sure. You're right. You're right. (laughs) You're not. But I'll tell you. Oh, no. I've ruined it. I've ruined it for everybody. (laughs) So... um, yeah, that's the first mystery, and then a series of other mysteries happen as it becomes clear that it, on at least one other of the visionary class ships that have now they're now well on their way outside Federation space, that there was a saboteur. Mm. Earl Grey. But he also he you know the first day of shooting, I shook his hand and I said, Mister Nimoy, you seem to think I I know what I'm doing here but I like really don't. And he had said, he had said to me in the, in the, in the audition for, for the Vulcan uh, um, mystique, think 1000 years of wisdom behind the eyes. And I thought, Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's a tall order. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot to, to put in the eyes. <laughs> Literary tricks. We're not messing around anymore. The reset button is gone. Characters lives are going to move forward. Fortunes are going to change. When things happen, you can take it seriously. It's not all just going to get forgotten by the time the next book comes out next month. This is going to be something that is going to carry forward and is going to have lasting repercussions on all of the literary books, not just the ones written by Mac, not just the ones in this particular subseries, but by joining them all together and having nods to the Star Trek Corps of Engineers, to Voyager, to DS9, to Enterprise. Standard Orbit. We've had some some various uh, folks and you know uh, guest star roles and things that had passed here and there, um, you know, the last year or so, um, and and all of that is sad. But when when somebody who was really a part of the foundation of what Star Trek is and what it became, it really hits you kind of hard. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, and most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. And if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We also have a review, and we have to apologize for this. This is from uh, a few months back. This is from June uh, from Australia. So so sometimes we, we don't go through all the countries when we're looking at iTunes reviews. So we did miss this one, but uh, we're happy to bring it to you now because uh, it's from one of our favorite listeners, someone we hear a lot from in the comments section as well. It's from Oz Trekkie. He says, Bruce and Dan do fantastic work continuing on from the great podcasts from Christopher and Matt, breaking down all of Trek novels, comics, and reference books. 
Having the people that produce and write Treklet on the podcasts gives us, the listener, a unique insight into the inspiration to, into the books we love to read. I'm starting at one and working my way through all 271 and counting. Still so much literature to get to. If you like Treklet, then this is a must-listen podcast. Hashtag live long and prosper. Hashtag idic. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, 271. Well, there's even more now. So thank you so much for listening and your insightful comments that we get to read every once in a while as well. So thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for doing that. And again, if anybody posts a review in Apple podcasts or iTunes, uh, you, you know, you can also tweet to us or email us or ever and just say, Hey, I put a review in there. Cause like Dan said, we don't check all the countries. And by the way, when we do check around the countries, we're not checking every country in the world. So <laughs> we may be missing your country. We primarily yeah. <laughs> look at where most of our listeners are from, which are like the U S Canada, UK, Ireland, Germany, Australia. Uh, but if you're somewhere else, let us know and we'll check it out. So anyway, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. Besides being on iTunes, you can do that many ways. You can join in in the con- you can join in on the larger conversation in the Babel Conference. It's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel B A B E L into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. And if you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select literary treks, and that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. We'd also like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shemutala, Justin Ozer, Jeffrey Harlan, and Casey Pettit for their support of the Trek FM network and for being associate producers for literary treks as well. Now, Bruce, when you're not covering yourself with the bark from the yield tree because those darn jassep keep trying to break down your body, where can we find you? Is that you, Dan? Is that you calling me? Do I hear you, Dan? Because if if that's you, Dan, calling for me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Admiral underscore Rex. You can also hear my voice, Dan. You can hear it out there by listening to a podcast like Live from the Edge with me and Brandy Jacola after every new episode of Discovery, and also Star Wars Report. Hey, talking Star Wars on the Star Wars Report, The Rise of Skywalker, The Mandalorian. Yeah, that's big stuff. Listen to that podcast, and you'll hear my voice there. And you can always find me in the Babel Conference. I'm sorry, do I know you? I I feel like we might have met years ago, but I don't think I've seen you since then. I, you seem unfamiliar to me. Well, Dan, tell us where I can find you because, yes, you do know me, but you don't know me, and you will know me, and you won't. Well, that's a little confusing, but I I will, won't, and am posting on Twitter at Kertrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. I am also on, off, and never on YouTube. No, that's not working. Okay. You can find me also on YouTube at youtube.com slash Kurtratz Productions. Uh, you can also find me on facebook.com slash Kurtratz Productions. I have a website at treklet.com where I'm reviewing Star Trek novels, both old and new. And of course, you can find me in the Babel Conference as well. Well, thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. What do you call that light reading? To each his own, number one.